Good afternoon and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this afternoon. CPSC staff will brief the commission on the fiscal year 2020 operating plan. CPSC's annual operating plan provides information on program activities and strategies as set forth in the agency budget process, along with specific performance targets and key milestones for the agency. Essentially, the ops plan is a roadmap for the CPSC. CPSC staff members at the table today are Mr. Dwayne Ray, Deputy Executive Director of Safety Operations, Mr. Jay Hoffman, our Chief Financial Officer and Director, Office of Financial Management, Mr. James Baker. Sorry, I read that wrong. I, I missed a comma. Let me go back in case anyone doesn't know you too. Uh, Mr. Jay Hoffman, who is our Chief Financial Officer and Director in the Office of Financial Management, and Mr. James Baker, Budget Office and Division Director for Budget Planning and Evaluation. At the conclusion of the staff's briefing here this afternoon, we will turn to questions from the commissioners, and those rounds will last 10 minutes each. Program staff members are also here and will be available to answer, an answer any questions as needed. Thank you all very much for being here, for your preparation of this document, and uh, we will now begin with the staff briefing. You may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here with all of you. I'm going to go through a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation before we get to your, uh, your questions. Um, first, just a recap of the FY 2020 operating plan process and where we are in that process. We're not quite to the end yet. The FY 2020 operating plan is premised on the 2020 performance budget request that we sent to Congress last February at a level of $127 million. That document's still pending before the Congress. Um, as you recall, uh, that document includes an appendix with approximately $8 million of unfunded items. Um, those are not included in this operating, operating plan. Um, some of the unfunded items do parallel requests that we made in the 2021 budget request, and so we're, we're keeping track of all of that depending on where the appropriations process settles out. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with where we're at in the appropriations, but let me just summarize that quickly. So Congress has not yet enacted an FY 2020 appropriation for us. Uh, however, the House did uh, pass a CR through November 21st. Uh, we think that's probable. Um, the House uh, passed an appropriations bill at $135 million that included $1.3 million in additional BGB grant funding. And just a few days ago, the Senate Appropriations Committee approved an FY 2020 appropriations bill that was consistent with the FY 2020 request at $127 million. Wherever this settles out, uh, hopefully in the next few months, we'll, we intend to use the mid-year process that will happen in early spring to reconcile any, any differences between the request and the final enacted. Um, as is the case with prior operating plans, the uh, uh, operating plan is aligned to our strategic plan and our budget priorities. I, I won't brief these in detail here, but we have four strategic goals of workforce prevention, response, and communication, and four established priorities that are articulated in the budget request of uh, focusing on risk, import surveillance, outreach, and education, and, and being data-driven. Slide four. Um, for those of you uh, watching at home, the, uh, the, the document, this is how the document is organized. The contents of the document are listed in the left-hand column. The document contains a summary of changes from the FY 2019 enacted to the FY 2020. Again, the request is $127 million year to year, so uh, not a lot of changes, although we do articulate those. It provides the funding and the FTE levels proposed by organization, key performance measures that will be reporting to Congress the proposed voluntary and mandatory standards activities, uh, epidemiological reports that we're planning on publishing this year, uh, plan details by organization, really get into the meat of what's going to be delivered, and an appendices uh, that articulates changes to performance measures, as well as operating plan alignment to the strategic plan. If you haven't delved into the uh, appendix, I would just draw you to, from page 47 to the end. It's a really good enunciation of the priority activities in each office and how those align to accomplishing the strategic goals and objectives. So it's a useful crosswalk. Um, there are a number of detailed chapters. Um, for each of the major mission delivery organizations. Those provide a resource summary, again, funding and FTE, an overview and priority activities those offices are proposing for the coming year, how their projects align to the strategic plan, their performance measures, specific operating plan measures and milestones. Uh, a few key assumptions. 
um, in this document. Again, this is a planning document. Uh, there are 539 positions planned, and that was from the FY 2020 budget request. However, there are only 534 FTE funded for a full year. Uh, that's a little bit of an unusual way to handle it. Um, the issue here is that the salary account is just a little bit short. Uh, however, we're also understaffed right now. And so the working assumption in the operating plan is that as a result of being understaffed, we should be able to close the resulting payroll gap of about $800,000 between now and a few months from now. So it's, it's, it's not a major concern. And we do have internal controls on this, so we won't overstaff and exceed that budget level to put you at ease there. Um, it does assume, assume a 2% pay raise. Uh, the non-pay inflation, we did put forward a request for non-payroll inflation. However, we do not have sufficient funding to adjust our operating allowances for inflation. So those are largely flat with a few reprogrammings here and there. And then VGB grants is budgeted at $2 million. There's currently $800,000 set aside in the FY 2020. We'll see where the appropriation settles out. And then there's $1.2 million in prior year money. Um, uh, th that's been appropriated that we have not yet executed. So that would give us, under this document, about $2 million for additional VGB grants if we decide to go that way. Um, this is our summary of changes uh, from the prior year. Again, pretty straightforward. We've reallocated $1.744 million <laughs> to account for changes to payroll, mostly pay inflation and pay increases. Again, there's still a slight shortfall in that. Uh, that's the $800,000 adjustment. Um, we did have a substantial savings in shared services this year of $973,000 as a result of switching to a new shared services provider on July 1st, and uh, then a, a small change to the OIG's uh, contract audit support budget at $29,000. So everything balances out at $127 million. Um, voluntary standards. Uh, the voluntary standards look very similar uh, as they did in the FY 2020 budget request that went up in February. There were 72 voluntary standards articulated in that document. Since that time, seven have been added and one deleted. They're listed here. The additions are adult portable bed rails, flooring, magnet sets, torch fuels, additive manufacturing mowers and wearables, and the one that was taken off was portable fireplaces. So new total is 78. For mandatory standards, we had seven in the FY 2020 request. Since that time, uh, proposal is to add seven more. Uh, for a total of 14, uh, I will just, I'm just going to enunciate the ones that are added uh, in the right-hand column. Uh, the additions are infant incline sleep products, non-full-size cribs and play yards, toddler beds, mattress 16 CFR part 1632, surface testing exemptions, FOIA fee update, table saws, and window coverings. One thing that the offices worked very hard on over the summer was to really try to enunciate what their priority activities and deliverables were in, in a very concrete manner. So we've added some additional slides uh, to that this year. And I'm just going to try to summarize by major mission delivery organization what those key priorities and deliverables are. This isn't inclusive of everything, but we've tried to, to hit, the, hit the most important ones. So in EXHR, uh, they are proposing to implement and evaluate the use cases for automated data classification and product matching. As you recall, that was the mid-year two part of the data analytics initiative that we put forward back in May, uh, implementing the online data clearinghouse to enable access to authorized incident data, uh, drive development of custom, custom window covering voluntary standards, uh, initiate an in, in, uh, information and education campaign for senior safety, uh, focus on micro-mobility devices, continue voluntary standards and research on 3D printing, developing Internet of Things connected product best practices guidelines, addressing fire hazards associated with rechargeable high energy density batteries, uh, pursuing development of OHV voluntary standards for uh, fire and debris uh, penetration hazards, and conduct testing of the effectiveness of requirements for CO safety shutdown systems. Uh, similar detailed priorities in the Office of Compliance are uh, evaluate business process review and make resource recommendations on the uh, integrated field system. As you recall, there was a study that we put forward as part of the mid-year to, to look at this process. Uh, and now this is setting aside some time and resources to try to uh, take a look at those recommendations. Uh, facilitate credit card notice to enhance recall effectiveness. Seek feedback from stakeholders on potential fast-track program changes. Uh, maximize recalling firms' notification to consumers, evaluate enforcement program, and align resources to address growth of e-commerce, 
develop an enforcement program to address compliance and safety related issues with counterfeit bicycle helmets and conduct follow up to the FY 2019 liquid nicotine enforcement. On the import surveillance side, uh, conducting an e-commerce pilot at an express carrier facility, and I understand that's getting underway soon. Uh, implement a national program to target all 15J rules, improve sampling and detention processes, and implement a pilot for timely removal of violative products while reducing burden, training first-time violators in the import community, and coordinating with compliance to implement a program uh, on the uh, non-compliant bicycle helmets. In international, uh, a couple items here, participating in the OECD Global Consumer uh, Information Campaign and producing uh, product safety videos for Chinese manufacturers on children's sleepwear, high energy density batteries and mattresses. In communications, uh, key priorities and deliverables are conduct outreach and consumer safety campaigns on pool safety, furniture and tip over prevention, baby safety, fire, carbon monoxide and community outreach. Uh, to expand social media engagement with safety messages and recalls and to conduct community outreach events to at-risk consumers to raise awareness on uh, furniture tip over safe to sleep, child drowning, and child poisonings. Uh, lastly, in the uh, exit or information technology, for those of you not familiar with the acronym, uh, some of their highlights are to evaluate the enterprise data analytic strategy proposal and pilot results to inform next steps. Again, these are from the mid-year items one and two back in May. Update the CPSC's uh, recall app. Conduct uh, saferproducts.gov research, redesign, and relaunch, including the mobile compatibility. Again, this was part of the mid-year uh, request that you all approved. And expand cloud-based service offerings by transitioning agency email to the cloud. Excuse me, to the cloud. Um, that concludes uh, the staff's presentation. Yeah. i turn it over to you for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. So the commissioners will begin their rounds of questions. We'll each have 10 minutes for questions, and we'll go as many rounds as we need, deem necessary to uh, make sure all the questions are answered. Uh, first of all, Jay, I just want to thank you publicly uh, to you and your office, uh, the shared services saving the agency close to a million dollars because of that transition to the shared services. Uh, thank you for your hard work on that. Thank you for knowing that's available to us, and really want to commend you and your staff for making that happen. Um, the two percent increase in pay, what are you basing that on? Um, okay, so the payroll when we figure it out, assuming what we know now with current projections as well as um, what is occurring, we um, are basing that on there's one million dollars in salaries. That's to annualize the 2019 pay raise that we never received additional funding for and that was identified in the 2020 um, request to Congress for the million dollars. And then on top of that, the other um, $700,000 is, is for locality, promotions, and within grades that we know will occur. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, let's start with EXHR. Um, <clears throat> maybe Mr. Boniface can come up and join us. Um, so the first bullet point is implement and evaluate, evaluate use cases for automatic data classification, product managing. This, Jay, goes more, or Mr. Hoffman, this goes more to you uh, in terms of, because you've referred to mid-year a couple times, have both of those contracts, mid-year one and mid-year two, have they both been let? Yes, they've both been awarded, and I believe we're kicking off mid-year two, which is the use cases one that you're directing to Mr. Boniface any day. Okay, thank you. And, and Mr. Boniface, if you could just elaborate on what you anticipate uh, will happen because of mid-year two and, and this initiative. Right, so the, uh, uh, the second mid-year item provides resources for us to get assistance in terms of bringing advanced uh, capabilities, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to uh, classifying data as it comes in and helping us to identify pattern, emerging patterns and in incident data. Uh, it's really helping us leverage and maximize the use of, uh, of our available data and hopefully set the foundation for us to, uh, in the future, expand uh, data efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, can you elaborate on bullet point three, drive development of custom window coverings, voluntary standard? Uh, yes, yeah, so we... Uh, uh, as the, I'm sure the Commission is, is well aware, we had uh, worked with uh, Window Coverings Manufacturers Association on uh, uh, a voluntary standard for uh, stock window coverings. We had had an agreement uh, uh, and uh, worked that particular standard getting it in place. It is now in effect. 
Um, uh, we had had an agreement with them to reopen uh, that standard to address custom uh, window coverings. Uh, that has to date not happened yet, and so this bullet point speaks to uh, our intent to work with them and, and get them to reopen that standard and take that issue up. Very good. Um, and then on the fourth bullet point, initiate an information and education campaign for senior safety. Now, does that come out of your shop or that comes out of communications? Uh, both, actually. So uh, the, uh, this continues kind of a collaboration that we've had with our office communications uh, on a variety of issues. This particular one focuses on uh, senior safety, uh, heavy emphasis on uh, slips, trips, and falls, as well as uh, fire hazards uh, associated with clothing. Dare I ask where that idea came from? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and then the fifth bullet point, focus on micromobility de devices. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. We have, uh, we've certainly all seen the growth in the market associated with uh, these devices. And so micromobility devices are uh, e-scooters, e-bikes, uh, uh, and so forth, hoverboards. Uh, we're seeing a, a significant increase in the number of these products out there in their utilization. We have certainly participated in uh, voluntary standards development in these areas. Uh, our focus is on uh, continuing to address that and particularly focusing on the increased exposure with some of these products. Um, if you look at the traditional, let's take e-scooters uh, as an example, they're being utilized in the commercial market uh, on a much more intensive basis than a typical consumer product. Different riders and so forth uh, using over time. So our intent is to work with the voluntary standards organizations to, to try to get a better understanding of what that brings in terms of hazards and, and what might be done to, to address those. And just along those same lines, when you're looking at e-scooters and you're looking at e-bikes, um, do we have the expertise within the agency to, to be able to evaluate those, or do we need to be thinking about that? That's a new technology that's, I'm not sure if it relates back to someone's expertise. We have a lot of experts in it, but do. Yeah, so we, uh, we do have tremendous capabilities uh, within the staff uh, organically. However, this is an area, particularly in the area of, because uh, uh, these products entail the use of software, uh, and that's an area where we focus on uh, obtaining additional capabilities. So we're working, we've got an effort underway with uh, NIST to help us on the technical infrastructure side of things. And we're in the process of uh, getting a contract in place to get technical assistance in terms of how we do the product testing, how do we do the evaluation of that software? Because that's a, that's a new and emerging area for us. And will there be any new work on, um, on the second column, bullet point three, address fire hazards associated with rechargeable high end energy density batteries? I know we've done a lot of work uh, with this issue, but will there be additional work and how do you see that? Yeah, we, uh, we certainly continue to focus on that, uh, on that area. Uh, as I'm sure the commission has seen, there are just a extensive growth in the number of products uh, using these uh, high energy density batteries. The applications are growing, uh, so we're working to uh, A, get a better understanding of the technologies and potentially available technologies to help mitigate some of the hazards we've seen in terms of thermal runaway and fires and so forth. And then lastly, um, when it comes to EXHR, the last bullet point is conduct testing of effectiveness of requirements for CO safety shutdown systems and voluntary standards for portable generators. The agency, along with industry, has really made tremendous strides in the time period that I've been here and, and really is just as recently from 2016 forward. We now have products in the market um, that with the shutoff technology and as well as the low emission technology. Can you just elaborate a little bit on, on what you anticipate with this? Is this a continuation of the testing and what we've done with NIST, but maybe just spend a little time on that? Sure. So uh, certainly over the past uh, several years, we've seen two voluntary standards uh, come out, one from PGMA and one from UL. And so what we are in the process of doing is testing uh, generators uh, uh, to those, operating to those two particular standards so we can evaluate the effectiveness of those two standards. Uh, it's ongoing work. We had a, uh, we put out the test plan over the summer uh, for public review and comment. We're in the process of actually right now of uh, distilling those comments and seeing what we can learn in terms of are there areas that uh, uh, 
uh, we should refine that test plan before going forward. That's great. Um, I do want to commend staff and all their work on this issue. It's been a critical issue. It's been one that has needed attention, and staff has done a really good job uh, with through both voluntary standards processes to to get standards in place. And we look forward to to uh, finding out the technology and what's most effective. I'm going to um, go to Commissioner Adler next, but I do want to publicly commend you and congratulate you on uh, your recent promotion as the new director for EXHR. Uh, I know I speak for my colleagues. Uh, we wish you well, and we're delighted to have you in the position. So thank you very much. Commissioner thank Adler. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I want to echo her sentiment about Dwayne. Welcome aboard. Uh, we've known you a while, and you've done an excellent job. We look forward to working with you in a EXHR. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, it's my eternal regret that uh, the Congress, in its infinite wisdom, does not ever see seem fit to give us an adjustment in our budgets for inflation and pay increases, even though they're giving us the pay increases. And so I think what you've done is a very clever and a, a useful approach to addressing that. So I want to thank staff also for an excellent presentation and a well-written op plan. It's very clear, and uh, even I could follow it. Um, so I did uh, have a couple of questions, and I, I thought I'd start with uh, the campaign for seniors. And this is one where I just need to have my memory refreshed, because I thought somewhere down the line uh, I had uh, seen that we had committed to doing on an annual or at least a biannual basis an EPI report on senior citizen hazards. Is that something that we've incorporated? Is that something that needs to be brought up if it's not part of our uh, general operating procedures? Uh, could somebody refresh my recollection about this? You you get either Dwayne or Dwayne to answer, uh, okay. unfortunately. Well, um, then Dwayne. Yeah, no, you, you pick Dwayne. Great. Um, I, I think the, the short version is we don't have a regularly scheduled list like you see in our typical list of EPI reports. Um, I think the way we've been viewing that is at, on an as-needed basis. We would refresh and look at that data. Um, however, um, Dwayne can probably talk in great detail about the work that their risk uh, management group is doing and looking at risk that are um, s specific to this and trying to incorporate that kind of work into the operating plan. Uh, yeah, so uh, as for all the product areas and, and hazard areas, we're looking at uh, uh, producing uh, uh, risk profiles, basically looking at what the hazards uh, uh, and risks are uh, across a number of areas, one of which is the older consumer safety hazards. Uh, our intent is that if we identify uh, uh, any differences or anything unusual there, then we would bring that forward. Um, as you're well aware, of this, uh, this area has been dominated over many years by, by two areas, and those are the two areas we're focusing on with the uh, information education campaign, the trips and falls, and the uh, clothing fires. But certainly, if, if we identify anything in that uh, analytic process, we would, uh, we would bring that forward. Well, I just look on page 10 of the op plan, and I see some of the other reports that are done. And uh, it does seem to me that having an ongoing update of those products that are particularly uh, dangerous to seniors and where seniors suffer a disproportionate number of injuries would be useful just to know uh, and, and there are a lot of folks who would be very interested in that, and I know groups like AARP and other citizen, senior citizens groups would be interested in that. So it certainly seems to me to be consistent to fit within this, so I may well be coming back with a proposal that we include that as part of our regular uh, process of issuing reports. So I have a couple of questions. I tried to give my questions to staff, and I, I may not get through all my questions, but I look forward to having discussions there. And, uh, Rich O'Brien, I'm sorry I didn't, I wasn't in the office when you came by to explain this, so I'm going to just ask it. Um, I see that we have what I think is a new metric, and that is recalls per billion dollars in consumer product imports for top 50 import sources nations. That seems to me to be an incredibly useful and meaningful piece of information. I'm just wondering, are the data out there for us to capture this as a, as a metric? Yes, uh, and if I can back up a little bit, every year um, international staff put together a business plan for the coming year. 
And in fact, every year we provide a written report of the outcomes from the plan that we wrote. And we use data extensively to plan the work that we do. So we pin our activities both to the agency's strategic plan and in the reports we um, specify which portion of the strategic plan we're aiming at with an activity. And we also base the work that we do on data that we get from the econ office within um, uh, EXHR. So one of the data areas that we're very interested in and we, we actually require for our planning is to know where do consumer products come from as far as which countries are the key exporters of consumer products. And for the goal we're discussing, what we've done is we looked at the top 50 sources of consumer products. By the way, they are identified by their um, international customs classification numbers and the U.S. Uh, number that correlates also to the standard global numbers. Uh, so we can see where uh, the top 50 sources of consumer products are. We know their value, um, so that's part of how we measure it. And then we take uh, that information and we, we actually do it country by country for purposes of planning our geographic emphasis. But we certainly have the aggregate number of value and number of recalls for those 50 sources. Thank you. And that, that to me is the epitome of being a data-driven agency is to be able to gather information like that and use that to be focused on uh, future activities. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I did want to ask a question about the uh, proposed ROV rulemaking termination. Does the termination of the rulemaking project on ROVs mean that we're no longer going to gather data on ROV stability issues, or are we going to continue to gather that information? Uh, it does not uh, preclude data gathering, and we will continue to gather data. Okay. Uh, question about window coverings. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, and uh, I thank Commissioner Kay for sharing this uh, information with me, I think I'd known it, but Health Canada has just issued a new standard for window coverings. Am I correct about that? Yes. And so uh, if we came out with a 15J rule that was substantially different and somewhat less stringent, would that not create all sorts of international problems and commerce problems between us and uh, Health Canada and the Canadians? Uh, well, I'm not not entirely sure we would propose something less stringent at this point. I do think the big difference as I see it right now is the choice in how the standards um, were segregated. Um, mm -hmm. The WCMA approach that we would look to incorporate, assuming it's widely complied with um, and, um, and we believe adequate to address the stock product uh, while continuing to work um, and try to drive that, that work on the custom product. So I'm not sure that um, they're completely, you know, uh, different from that perspective. I think they cover a different set of products. Uh, but did, did the Canadian standard not also cover custom uh, window yes, covers? Yes, it, it is all inclusive. Okay, and, so and that, that, that is automatically a, yeah. a point of departure. Mm, that, that also makes me nervous. Okay. Um, one of the questions about this, uh, and I'm looking on uh, page 13 about urgent care centers, I just want to make clear in my own mind that what we're doing with respect to assessing urgent care centers is that we're not actually doing a study of them and gathering the data epidemiologically, but we're looking to see whether it's feasible and whether it makes sense to proceed to gather data from urgent care centers. Am I correct in stating that? Uh, yes, yeah, so we are, uh, our efforts are focused on evaluating whether it makes sense for us to, to collect those data and, and not, to, uh, not to engage in a full collection. Okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm reassured to hear that because that would be a big investment of CPSC resources. It may be worthwhile, but I'd really like to make sure before we uh, jumped into that lake that we understood what, what's involved. Um, may I ask for a quick summary on uh, tip overs? Uh, where are we in the voluntary standards? Uh, procedure and are we still on track with the mandatory standard? Not, not that I care about that, but 
Uh, yes, yeah, so we've, uh, uh, we continue to work uh, uh, in, in support of both efforts. So in the voluntary standards area, we are actively engaged, uh, particularly in the development of test methods to deal with the uh, different uh, hazard dimensions that I think we've talked about before, drawer loading, uh, impact loading, um, uh, drawer openings and closings and so forth, uh, floor surface. Uh, in parallel with that, we are uh, also working on the mandatory standard uh, as uh, as proposed in this operating plan. Yeah, and I just want to commend staff for taking a very comprehensive perspective on hazards associated with tip overs in furniture. I see that my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks to the staff for a good operating plan. I appreciate that it's, uh, Mr. Boniface, I would not get up if I were you, unless you need to stretch your legs for about three seconds, feel free. Uh, I appreciate that the staff has uh, proposed what I would describe as a more ambitious operating plan than we've seen in the last couple of years, at least at a high level. And I also appreciate that staff has looked to incorporate specific projects into the operating plan that have been of concern at the commission level. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, I wanted to start with you on the numbers and the staffing numbers, and I'm on page two of the draft. In the in column two at the FTEs, I didn't go ahead and add them up, but above the, in the part where it says budget details above centrally managed costs, does that FTE total for 2020 add up to 539 before you minus the five out? Yes. And your assumption is that through attrition, basically, that we will not that we will get down to 534 correct that, that's basically correct i mean we're under now so i don't right. even need to wait on attrition and so you need to change those somewhere from somewhere those five will disappear and so do you need to change the office allocations to reconcile with the changes to get down to 534 that's something the commission wanted to do. They could do it. I think what I'm trying to convey is I don't think it's necessary. It, remember, FTE are hours. So we're talking about 10,400 hours out of 1.12 million. Um, nine tenths of 1%. I doubt we'll get to that level of precision. Okay. But it, so when we see the mid year, for instance, you don't think it'll change? I don't think it'll change. Keep in mind, we set aside $800,000 mm -hmm. for VGB grants. If we weren't directed to do VGB grants, that gap would close itself. You're saying if we were fully staffed? and we had other costs we would just draw from the VGB? It, it, depending on how Congress settles it out. Yeah. So in the Senate, it was not included. In the yeah. House, it was. That's another variable that we're waiting to see for the full year appropriation so we can do the math. Got it. So let's, so let's say we're fully staffed on October 1, and I realize that never happens. Mm -hmm. But if we were, then you're saying we would need an additional $800,000 to meet our uh, pay raise yep. and, uh, and associated costs? Yep, that's right. And so let's say we were appropriated, you know, we'll split the difference between the House and the Senate number, for argument's sake, 131. And so you're saying we would have an additional 4.2 left over at that point to spend in the mid-year or to reconcile in the mid-year? Uh, I won't stipulate to the numbers, but yes, there would be a delta that we would something have like to, that. yeah, something like that. Keep in mind, you'd have a pay raise likely in January. Correct. And so what I'm trying to get to with all these questions is, what will the staff process be? I'm, I'm anticipating we'll get more than 127. And I'm anticipating we'll get more than 127.8, meaning there will be some kind of surplus, even if we had been fully staffed by October 1. Clearly, the surplus will be more than that because we're not fully staffed by October 1. Does staff plan to hold off on executing the allocation of any of those additional funds until the commission approves something at mid-year, or will staff start executing allocation of funds and then seek to get ratification by the commission at mid-year? You know, I, I, would, I would obviously want to consult with the executive director, but it, it seems to me that you're approving $127 million, and so that's what we're going to be spending, and we would come back to you with what the plan was to spend above that level. I will say that you know, we're thinking ahead. We've already started to do the analysis to say, well, of the things we requested in the 2021 and the 2020, how would those sort out under a $130 million scenario or a $131 million scenario? So whatever we end up getting, and I hope you're right, I hope it is above $127 million, I think we'll be very uh, nimble in working with the executive director to bring proposals forward. Um, I think we could wait to mid-year, but if the commission wanted to move faster, that would be 
you know, your prerogative. Sure, and, and just to make it clear, I'm not uh, speaking on any other commissioner's behalf, but my request would be whether it's through mid-year or even sooner that the commission make the decisions on mm -hmm. how any additional funds are allocated. Yeah, I understand or that. Allocated. Uh, Mr. Boniface, I want to turn now to some of the EXHR items in the op plan. I wanted to start with the table saw rulemaking. At the time the operating plan was drafted, I'm imagining staff did not anticipate that there would be a direction from the commission to move forward with the final rule on table saws. Is that correct? That is correct. And so what changes were made to the draft to accommodate the resources needed to fit in a table saw final rule? I think that staff had planned resources to work in that area. It was just a shift of what exactly those resources were, were, would be doing. Uh, as you recall, staff had proposed a particular research effort to, uh, uh, to get at some of the uh, issues. Uh, we just uh, refocused those within that same MIS code to, to work on the final rule. Got it. So it was a total wash in terms of what was antici anticipated from staff months to either do an additional study or to draft a final rule? It, largely a wash, yes. Okay, that's good to know. And then on furnaces, how come staff is proposing DATR instead of an NPR? Uh, th this is an area that uh, we've worked on for many, many years, so certainly have thoughts in terms of what a uh, rule would look like. Uh, however, we've uh, 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 Commission has put out the ANPR. We are working through uh, and, and anticipate working through comments for much of the year and anticipate we may have to do some additional technical research to, to address some of those questions. I see. Okay. And when do you think you'll have a sense of what, of what that technical research would be? Uh, uh, certainly, we'd be shooting to have that uh, identified before the mid year process. So we okay. Can, uh, bring that forward. Okay. That's good to know. Something I'd like to continue to track with you, please. On um, window coverings, so I'm trying to get a better sense of what the deliverable will be. You say, and uh, Chairman Burkle quoted it, drive development of custom window coverings, uh, voluntary standards. What's the deliverable on that? What should we expect the result to be? Uh, right, so the initial activity will be uh, working to bring a uh, letter to WCMA and uh, actively pushing them to, uh, to reopen that particular standard. I think we're in a, uh, uh, once we get that opening, then, uh, then it's a matter of uh, working with them, our technical staff, uh, uh, as we did for the uh, stock solutions, identifying particular hazards and solutions that, uh, that we can address. I see. And do you anticipate the technical solutions are any different than what was incorporated on the stock side? Uh, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of similarity, but at this stage it would be difficult to to, to say definitively yes on all or no one on some. And in the letter you mentioned, is it, do you, does staff plan on a technical basis to track the stock requirements or as Commissioner Adler pointed out, there are different, slightly different requirements, for instance, the pull cord uh, force on inner cords, do we anticipate tracking the Health Canada requirements? Yeah, we are certainly looking into that uh, uh, that issue that uh, uh, really WCMA has cited as, as a reason for not opening the standard. Uh, we are looking to try to incorporate that into some other plan technical work on uh, child pole strength. It's a uh, it's a bit of a different uh, different phenomenology uh, because of the way you would, the child would actually grasp the cord, but uh, but we do anticipate looking into that. And does that additional work have to happen before you settle on the technical requests in the letter? Uh, no, I don't, I don't anticipate. I think our initial foray is going to be pushing hard uh, again to try to get them to reopen that standard and to start addressing some of the things we know we need to address. Got it. And on the 15J or the proposed 15J, one of the areas that has repeatedly been brought to my office's attention is concern that there is not really a very good understanding of the definition or the difference between a stock product and a custom product. Does staff feel that it has a concrete grasp on what the difference is between the two? Uh, I think as part of our uh, work with WCMA on, on a standard, I think we developed a good understanding. Um, I think it will take, I, I think the work on the custom solution may help refine that, sharpen the, the point on that uh, understanding, but I do think we have a, a a good basis for the 
Got it. So it sounds like then we might not see even see a draft 15J until the custom work progresses. I think we're looking at uh, uh, co-evolving those those two particular efforts. Okay. I look forward to the co-evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Biaco. Thank you. Um, I have one general question, and then I tried to group my questions by department. So, Mr. Boniface, if you don't mind hanging out, um, and congratulations on your new post. I think you're going to be great in that job, and I know it's a it's a big it's a big job. So, anything we can do to help, certainly let us know. Um, I'm not sure who this question goes to, but on page two, buried in footnote two, um, there's an addition of an FTE under the Office of Executive Director for Consumer Ombudsman. What is this? Why do we need it? Why is it under the executive director? And what are the job duties? This is a new one for us here at the CPSC. I think I get to answer that one. Uh, this is our attempt to reflect some of the priorities that we heard in this most recent mid-year um, cycle uh, for desire for this um, ombudsman position. I think with regards to where it sits organizationally, um, there's no like perfect location but we do have within the, the executive director's office uh, an ombudsman small business ombudsman so we thought that would make sense from that perspective um, I, as i understand the desire um, is to um, be an ombudsman to represent consumer interest in our work um, uh, a lot of focus on voluntary standards and trying to get more representation and engagement from uh, consumer interest in that in that process where did you get that understanding because that's this is new for me I've, I haven't I, I don't I remember just, this at the mid-year you know, it's okay uh, I think just through going through the process and then through our weekly meetings with the Commission offices we uh, we reflected on that and, and presented that as an option for the Commission to consider okay um. Do you have a description of the job duties that this person would do? I do not in front of me, but I'm sure we can get that together for you. Okay. And, and have you been interviewing or who's interviewing nope. for this? This is uh, nothing's been, uh, no vacancy has been put out. Uh, none of that process has started. Um, starting on page nine, Mr. Boniface, um, I think this all falls under um, uh, your, your umbrella uh, in, in no particular order. Um, burden reduction. There are two projects listed here. Um, one is a burden reduction for manufactured fi fibers and the other is a general wearing apparel burden reduction review. Um, are either of these burden reduction projects in response to the RFI on possible testing exemption for spandex fibers? Uh, the uh, uh, part 1610 would be associated with that uh, but uh, include other dimensions as well. Okay, because I, I was under the impression that the um, spandex fibers exemption was to come up under this year's op plan, and I, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm just wondering how it spilled over into, next, into 2020. Right, so we, uh, as you recall, we issued the request for information, we got uh, some information back on that. Staff is, uh, uh, I think that comment period wrapped up uh, midsummer. Staff has been chewing through that. Uh, if, uh, I'm, if you bear with me a moment, we have, I believe, a deliverable a milestone to take a uh, to bring forward additional data, the results of that additional analysis to the commission to this fiscal year. Okay, and, and so what would these two um, additional burden redu reduction projects include? Uh, so the uh, the manufactured fibers uh, is again a final rule briefing package. So we've got the notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, that staff has, has prepared this year, the, the final role will uh, look to, to uh, obviously finalize that. Uh, the part 1610, we're looking at again a, uh, an analysis of the, uh, uh, of the comments received. There may be some additional data collection uh, needed uh, for that, uh, and so we would have to have a discussion with the commission about that, uh, that effort. Okay. Uh, the um, under on page nine under the other ongoing or potential rulemaking related activities helmet petition. I thought that was withdrawn. Uh, it was. I believe that it's uh, a matter of timing on this. Okay. On this so it just needs package. to come off. Okay. And while we're talking about helmets, I've been noticing. I've been seeing on Twitter. Um, 
a request from the CPSC for information from parents regarding any concussions that their children suffer by, while wearing a helmet and to report that information to us. Um, I know that Commissioner Kay has been involved um, with some of the um, athletic equipment and I, I asked him about it and he wasn't sure either. So I'm not sure where that tweet comes from and what project that is, where that's reflected and what we're doing with that information. Do you know? Uh, certainly. I think this is a joint effort with the Office of Compliance. Um, uh, what we are looking to try to do is get a better understanding of, uh, uh, of head impacts and head impact injuries. Uh, uh, we feel that there's an under-reporting of that to us, and what we're tr basically trying to do is encourage reporting, uh, get better data in so we can have a better under inform a better understanding. Okay. I understand that. Is it reflected in the op plan anywhere? Because I just didn't see it. Um, I don't know if it's explicitly... Uh, called out, um, but it would be in the uh, uh, mechanical hazards voluntary codes area. And it does not look like it's explicitly delineated. Okay. Uh, mandatory on page nine, mandatory standard summary table, the FOIA fee update deliverable um, noted as a final rule here. Is this still on track since I think we pulled, I think we were pulling to withdraw this um, notice of proposed rulemaking? I, I'm, I'm, I thought this was on our, on our plates now, so I'm not sure how that fits into the op plan now. I would actually have to defer to the Office of General Counsel on that one. They, they own that particular okay. project. Okay. Any idea? Um, there is a current package in front of the commission. The discussions have been to withdraw that package and update it uh, to reflect the latest uh, uh, financials and a reg flex analysis, and that package would come back up this week as an NPR. Okay. Mandatory standards, again on page nine, um, on the mandatory standard summary table, clothing storage unit tip overs, the deliverable is an NPR. Do we have an expected time frame on this? I have this piggybacks on what I believe Commissioner Adler asked. Uh, yes, we anticipate that'll be later in the fiscal year. Uh, again, what we are doing is we're doing a, uh, an awful lot of testing to inform test methods and uh, criteria uh, and working with the voluntary standards. So we're, we're looking at that being later in the fiscal year. Okay. Um, epidemiology reports um, on e the e-scooter report. What does that mean? Uh, so what we're looking at is, uh, again, with um, uh, these devices, it is a, a major expansion in terms of their utilization, number of products and their utilization out there. And so what we're looking at is a, similar to our other epi reports, a characterization of the incidents and injuries uh, that we've seen with those. So, so on the, uh, what are you calling this, micromobility, I, I, have, I have several questions on this. I, I've been following this pretty closely, and I actually taught a class on this not that long ago. So I, I do know that there are several voluntary standards for um, scooters and e-bikes currently in place. So when we have that listed as something we're going to be working on, what exactly are we going to be working on? And um, I, I want to make sure we're not... Um, reinventing the wheel, if you will. And same thing on the reports. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, there. There are a lot of data out there. We actually have a lot of data our, ourselves. And so part of this effort, part of the epidemiology report is to uh, aggregate, synthesize, and bring that information forward so it can be better used by, by the community. Uh, in terms of voluntary standards, uh, we are certainly engaging in, um, in groups with the UL, ASTM, um, uh, working in this area and we anticipate uh, doing more of the same this year. Do we have a specific plan or set of goals that's written down or are we just sort uh, of winging it? So uh, on that particular area, what we're looking at doing is uh, uh, bringing forward the incidents, that we, the growth in incidents that we've seen, particularly associated with um, uh, uh, commercial use of these, these products, which we, which we see as uh, driving exposure up significantly. Uh, and looking at and working with ASTM, UL, and others to try to identify are there changes uh, in the hazard pattern resulting from the higher use that then uh, requires to make some adjustments in those voluntary standards. Okay. Um, are we working with any other organizations? Because a lot of the uh, rules and regulations that apply to, to, to the, uh, share, the sh bike shares, I call them, or scooter shares, uh, you know, are outside of our jurisdiction. I'm just wondering how that interacts. Uh, we, we certainly had discussions with NHTSA, uh, who has a, a, 
uh, jurisdictional element here as well. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, state and local uh, governments working on this issue as well, more from the, the, the uh, interaction with the public uh, uh, and less so from safety, but uh, we look to work, work with all the parties. Okay, terrific. Uh, my time's up. I'll be back. Thank you very much, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank all of you and your staffs for being here and putting on the presentation today. Uh, and, and this was a useful walkthrough of the, the proposed plan and clearly a lot of thoughts gone into that. Um, at this time, I, I don't have any questions, but the plan as it's currently drafted does not address all of my priorities for the agency. Uh, but I nevertheless think it is a good starting point for, for their discussion and I look forward to having that and working with you and all my colleagues here on the dais uh, to get this into final form so that we can get it implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now begin the second round of questions. Um, I guess, Duane, I, I apologize to ask you to come back up here because I, I want to follow up on NICE and what Commissioner Adler talked about. With regards to the urgent care centers, I think what you had mentioned was what's in this uh, ops plan proposal is um, in terms of does it make sense for us to even look at urgent care centers and I just wanted to uh, as opposed to just hospital emergency rooms can you how will we find that out and um, just maybe be a little more specific on that sure so we've uh, uh, we've done a, a fair bit of research looking at uh, emergency department utilization uh, uh, urgent care center uh, utilization over the last year we've gotten a uh, I, I think a solid sense of uh, changes in the impact that urgent care centers have had in the emergency departments. Uh, what we're looking to do is uh, we've contracted for a frame to get a, uh, a more detailed quantitative characterization of the urgent care center utilization. Uh, and our intent is to analyze that to take a look at uh, does that then validate or change our understanding of the impact urgent care centers have had on uh, emergency department utilization. Uh, I think we went into this process uh, with questions about whether some of the injuries that had typically been seen by emergency departments, whether they're going to urgent care centers, uh, I think we're a little less sure of that now, and we're just looking for this additional data. Thank you. And then um, while you're still sitting there, on the ROV termination that Commissioner Adler brought, uh, raised and the whole issue, um, I think his question had to go to the point, are we going to continue to have the ROV reports, or actually the ATV reports with, I think there's been a, a real desire to uh, pull out, if we can, the ATVs and the ROVs. So my understanding in your response is that is not going to change with the ROV termination. Uh, that is correct. We will, uh, and we'll continue to report. What we're looking at uh, in the EPI report is a segregated but combined report for all off-road vehicles, ATVs, UTVs, ROVs, uh, but have them be identifiable as distinct subcategories. That's good. That is very good to hear. Um, and then um, just, to, just to clarify even further on that point, the ROV termination has to do with lateral stability, not debris penetration, not the thermal issues that uh, are that, being discussed in the voluntary standards. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about window coverings just to clarify um, because the comment was made about Health Canada and their new standard. I mean, I don't think we, I think harmonization is an ideal and I've been hearing about it since, since I've come to this agency, but that isn't how we operate. We do what we think is best and what our data, um, what our data reflects and, and we proceed accordingly. But just my understanding of the Health Canada standard is not in effect. It doesn't go into effect for two years when it was passed last May. So I don't know, the, I, th I thought I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there would be um, tracking Health Canada and seeing whether or not their new, their new standard is effect. I'm not sure I heard that correctly. Maybe I misunderstood that. No, I, I think what uh what Mr. Ray was, was saying is that okay. we have a particular evaluation of uh, under 15J uh, that we have to make. Is it widely complied with and is it effective? And I think what we're looking at is, is uh, as part of bringing that 15J package forward is, is doing that analysis. 
Um, uh, but the Health Canada issue is not fully linked with that. Uh, uh, Health Canada has developed their own standard, implemented their own standard. Uh, as you note, it's two years away, so it's not uh, being complied with, and certainly there are uh, elements within the industry that are uh, uh, citing challenges with that. Yes, and, and I think that that's different than what we've achieved. We already have a voluntary standard for stock products, which I think is a huge step forward when it comes to window safety. Um, I don't have any more questions for EXHR. <laughs> uh, I can't speak for my colleagues, though. That's right. Um, I was, would just like to ask Rich O'Brien to come up for a second. I want to just ask a question. That first bullet, participate in the OECD Global Consumer Information Campaign, if you could speak to that. Yes, every year um, the OECD Working Party on Consumer Product Safety um, works with a, a number of its members, those who are most interested, to develop um, a topic and then um, media um, messaging for a topic that would be exposed globally at the same time. So um, I have to confess that I forgot <laughs> the topic that's coming up, but maybe from communications, you can remind me. If recalled. What? If it's recalled. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Thank you for that. So the, the messaging and the one that we're going to be working on next is if the product's recalled, respond to the recall. And so, again, that would be a global message, and it would be something w we will contribute to locally for use in the United States. We'll share with our colleagues around the world some of the things that we develop in case they want to use them. Others will do the same thing, and to the extent that the communications office wants to take advantage of that, um, they'll be used here. Thank you and very much. I'm sorry, did you have something to add? No, I have just that Joe may want to say more, but that's all I... That's all I have. Mr. Mardiak, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Um, I was going to uh, ask um, Mr. K to come up, talk a little bit about compliance and some of his uh, priorities. So um, what was highlighted in the briefing today, the first bullet is evaluate business process review, make resource recommendations on the integrated field system. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So as I think the commission is aware, uh, uh, IFS is a system that we rely on for a, a variety of tasks, particularly in the regulated group in the field, uh, and it is antiquated. Uh, and uh, doesn't have the reporting capabilities, doesn't have the consistency of input uh, facilities that you really would want to have, nor does it really, uh, it wasn't constructed with the, the other systems that we have here at the Commission you know, in mind. And so ultimately we want to move to a point where we have uh, a modern system that works well collectively and individually with, with our, our other systems. But the starting point for any such system is to come up with the business process that you want it to reflect. Uh, in my experience where, you know, IT systems go off the rails is when you get a lot of technical input and, and a lot of building that goes on before you really understand what the best fundamental business processes are. And so we'll be working closely with, um, with the contractor that we appreciate the commission authorizing at the mid-year to, uh, to really flesh out our business processes and, and try to get ourselves positioned well for, uh, for technology improvement. So at this point, you're really just trying to figure out what, what would work, what would be the best way to approach this? What's the best way for us to do our, our work with sort of knowing sort of what the technological options are in mind um, and, and sort of developing those thoughts uh, collectively together but, but with an emphasis on making sure that, that ultimately we feel confident we're processing the work in the right way and then finding the technology match for that. Thank you. And while I have you at the table and I have a minute left, can you just talk a little bit about bullet point two? I'm just kidding. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
facilitate credit card notice to enhance recall effectiveness? Sure. So uh, I think you know as we've as we learned from the recall workshop and as as we discuss frequently, you know the very best uh, and most effective way we can reach consumers when there is a recall is when we can contact them directly. Uh, and uh, you know, we know that uh, in many cases the 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 that information is is available to some people. Um, through the credit card information system. It's not something that we've really involved ourselves with. There's a number of different players, from the retailers to the banks and the like. Uh, and, and there clearly are, are potentially some obstacles to us being able to work with business to try and access that data more readily. Uh, but we want to explore the extent to which the, the Commission might be able to facilitate more ready use of that data to accentuate um, direct notice uh, in recalls. And so we intend to have some, some dialogue with the stakeholders involved to learn more about how we might be able to play that role. Very good. And I would just add that would include more likely than not RELA. I would hope they'd be in at the table. Yes. Okay, good. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. I notice both compliance and EXIS uh, have specific projects uh, addressed to counterfeit and non-compliant bicycle helmets. And I guess my question is, is there a particular issue or a particular risk that we've discovered with these that has us set them separate and apart from regular compliance and uh, import surveillance activities? Well, well, we do think, you know, our mission is not the counterfeit mission, but we do Understood. think that when there is a, a, a likely nexus between counterfeit and safety, that that, that that does draw our attention to it. And that's what we see in the bike helmet arena. Yeah, I, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I certainly understand that, but my question is, is that's, that's the case for lots of products, but we've specifically isolated bicycle helmets. Is there a particular issue with bicycle helmets? Well, there has been some public attention to the fact that, that certain counterfeit helmets have not passed safety standards. That has also been our anecdotal uh, observation. Uh, I don't think we've done a, an extensive uh, report on, on an analysis of, of, of such helmets over time, but our, our general observation is that when a, a, a bike helmet is counterfeit, it is, there is a high likelihood that it won't meet the safety standards. And, and so we are looking at it as an opportunity to explore that nexus and trying to see how we can enhance our targeting, how we can enhance, uh, you, know, you know, working very closely with Jim's group, uh, and how we can uh, most efficiently address those, uh, those violations or potential violations, knowing that the testing process itself is somewhat cumbersome and resource intensive. Uh, as well as what role we might be able to play with some of the online purveyors of helmets to see what kind of uh, additional safeguards might be able to be put in place to prevent the listings. Uh, and so that's what we'll be looking at. So in terms of things explicitly identified, I want to ask about something that I couldn't find explicitly identified, and that's residential elevators. Uh, do we have resources dedicated to uh, residential elevators and what general category would, would one find those resources? Well, I obviously can't comment on any particular. Not talking about a specific, just uh, where are the resources that, uh, are they, or do we have resources dedicated to, maybe it's a better way of asking. We certainly have a focus on the issue, and I think in conjunction with uh, the executive director, we're working to make sure we can bring the resources we need to the issue. Uh, okay, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, with respect to a point that uh, the chair brought up about urgent care centers, uh, the one thing that I'm not asking this question of you, and this is of course Dwayne, uh, is that before we would find it worthwhile, I would guess, to do a big project on urgent care centers, we'd have to find that there's a di at least a different mix or a different frequency or severity of injuries associated with urgent care centers than we're finding in emergency rooms. And I remember years ago, we did a physician's office survey because we were absolutely uh, insistent that there would be huge discrepancies. And my, as I recall, there weren't huge discrepancies. Is it your impression, at least at this point, that we're going to find uh, big, big discrepancies or differences? Yeah, I, th I think our preliminary evidence on the urgent care centers is that they are not uh, seeing sort of the higher end uh, consumer product related injuries. But again, that's what we're looking for that, uh, that data frame and subsequent analysis to, to definitive, more definitively establish. 
Okay. Well, I, that's that's a good thing, and I'm glad you're doing that. Uh, I wanted to come back to uh, window coverings, and uh, is it your eventual goal that if we get the uh, voluntary standards sector to do a an upgrade or an expansion to cover custom windows, window coverings, that we would then be able to do a 15J rule, or because it's custom, does that mean it's a, a more challenging approach? I, I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have an answer at this stage, because one of the challenges there is, is it readily identifiable, readily observable? Exactly. And I'm not 100 percent sure that that will be the case. Yeah, that, and that's a fair assessment. That's actually my best guess, and I'm glad that um, everybody's still gra grappling with that question. Um, I wanted to uh, jump to communications, if I might, because I had two questions about changes from last year. One of the um, things I do obsessively is I look at last year's out plan and I go through and say, where has it changed? Uh, because sometimes that tells me there's a, a difference in focus. So when I looked at uh, page 36, I saw that the metric for, in this I'll just quote, number of engagements with CPSC safety messaging on social media channels by stakeholders has jumped from 320,000 last year to 840,000 this year. That's a big jump. Can you explain that? Yes, thank you. Uh, that number, the 320, was from the previous year. And as yes. we went into this year, we realized we are actually doing I'm glad to say very well, and we're surpassing that number, and we're much higher. So that's why we set the ceiling higher for next year. Wow. Okay. I wish you good luck, and it sounds like uh, you're on top of that. I also noticed the change in the number of collaborative, collaborative activities initiated with st stakeholder groups has jumped from 28 last year to 55 this year. Can you explain what's going on with that? Again, it's a similar situation where the number was from the previous year, and this again, this year we've been performing very well with that, and so we are hitting higher than that, and so we set the ceiling higher for next year. Uh, okay. Uh, those are all the questions I have at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dwayne, please, if you don't mind, or Mr. Boniface, thank you. Thank you for coming back. The ROV termination package, is it already drafted? Uh, we have the package that came before the commission previously, but mm -hmm. we do not have a, a fresh version of that package, so we would have to go in and work on that. Okay, and so you that's not done yet? Correct. And do you have a rough estimate of the staff months that that would take? Uh, I do not off the top of my head. I, we can bring that back. Okay, I'd be curious to know. And would it be the same staff that would be working on that package, putting aside the general counsel's office, I understand that if any involvement they have, I mean the technical staff, the team, would it be the same team that would be drafting that package that would also be working on the voluntary standards work with regard to fires and debris penetration? I, I think certainly they would be involved. I don't know at this stage whether we would have them uh, be the primary staff on that or whether we'd have some other staff to help out with that. Or presumably they'd have some involvement in they it? They would have some involvement. Okay. And um, recognizing that the Commission did not adopt the termination package a few years ago, and also recognizing that the Commission since then has become aware of additional non-related hazards associated with these products, what's the safety benefit? What's the consistency with the agency's mission to be spending the resources on a termination package? Uh, I think that the uh, uh, what this allows us to do is focus uh, collective efforts on what we're seeing as the current hazards, and what we're seeing as the current hazards are the uh, the thermal issues and the debris penetration. Uh, I do think that there's some uncertainty with the regulated industry uh, with this other uh, stability uh, out there. Meaning, it's your sense that they can't focus on the debris penetration and the fire hazards because they're still so freaked out by the rollover and uh, occupant protection issues? Uh, I'm not sure I would use those exact words, but I, I do think that there's concern on the part of the regulated community. Uh, and do you feel like that's materially impacting staff's ability to have productive conversations in the voluntary standards arena? Uh, I, I think we continue to look for ways to streamline our engagements and, and get things moved, moved through. I see. Got it. And then on another voluntary standard uh, relationship to a mandatory standard, 
So inclined sleepers originally came from the bassinet standards, correct? Uh, correct. So at some point in the last, whatever it was, five, six, seven years ago, ASTM decided with staff's blessing to carve out and create a new inclined sleeper standard. Is that accurate? Uh, that is correct. And so at this point, what's the benefit of having a separate standard as opposed to just returning it to bassinets? Uh, I think where staff is looking at this particular issue is make a, uh, 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 a sleep standard that's it's either going to be a bassinet or other and try to uh, exhaustively capture what, uh, what products are out there. Outside so that, of bassinets? Pardon? Outside, outside of, of bassinets. Bassinet. And outside of cribs Correct. and pack and plays or um, uh, uh, play arts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think what that uh, provides us the opportunity is to say you're either in bucket one or bucket two uh, and uh, prevent any kind of uh, regulatory loopholes. Got it. So the draft, whatever would be coming up then, that's not a bassinet, that's not a play yard, that's not a crib, would be in this other draft standard you're talking about? Correct. But why call it inclined sleeper then, since it sounds like it encompasses a lot more? Um, I think what we're looking at is that the uh, crib standard would uh, would address the non-inclined uh, uh, range of products, and then you're either so either you're either inclined or you're not. If you're inclined, then you're either a bassinet or you're not, and so capture it that way. I see. And is there any other term that would be more inclusive than just inclined sleepers? Uh, certainly, staff would be open to suggestions on that, okay. but uh, we've not seen a better term. Okay. I would encourage it only because I do think that there is an internal inconsistency with the idea of an incline sleeper. I don't think that that is consistent with the best practices that staff itself promotes scientifically. And so I think that we would be doing the public a favor if we would come up with something. And it sounds like it would also be more consistent with what you're talking about, that it wouldn't be narrowly viewed as just one type of product category, but would incorporate more. That's it for now. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Biacco. Dwayne, back to scooters. Um, when, when we were talking about the report, where will that data come from? Is it going to come from NICE data? Uh, so from all sources. We have uh, uh, the, the, certainly NICE data. We have uh, 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 doc, by docs from manufacturers. We've got consumer reports, uh, consumer reported information. Um, and then available literature and so You don't forth. mean the magazine like consumers who are reporting? Correct. Okay. Uh, Saferproducts.gov. Do, do you know whether Nice currently has injury codes for micro, my, I like this, micro mobility devices? Uh, it's not uh, subdivided uh, to the degree that, uh, that uh, we'll be able to definitively establish, but we'll be able to talk about the trends in this category as a whole. Are we able to um, encourage the, um, the NICE data codes to be broken down? That will uh, help us. We, uh, uh, we can and continue to look at that. And I think given the emergence of this area, uh, rapid emergence of this area over this product over the last couple of years, that is certainly something we are looking carefully at. Okay. I, I want to switch uh, over to vaping. Um, I'm concerned that we are experiencing a vaping crisis in this country, and uh, I'm wondering, um, first of all, in the Electrical Hazards Voluntary Standards Code section of the OP plan, uh, the third bullet point states study of high energy density batteries used in end products. So my question would be, are there plans for the staff to be involved in UL 8139, which is the electrical systems of electronic cigarettes, which would evaluate the safety of the heating battery charging systems of vaping? Uh, we, uh, we try to cover as many of the uh, related standards as, as possible under the, on these areas. I can't speak at this stage of how much time we're devoting to that one particular standard, uh, but in general we try to cover as much as possible and we work with our partners, for example, in that area with uh, Food and Drug Administration to try to extend our, our reach. Uh, what, what is our current um, interaction with the FDA on at least vaping? Uh, we continue to have discussions. Uh, we, um, uh, and a part of this, I think, is a question for compliance. But uh, from the uh, EXHR perspective, work with them on 
uh, identifying uh, emerging battery issues, sharing information, sharing uh, insights in terms of what we've seen in this growing high energy density battery arena uh, and try to uh, try to work with them at that. Uh, the the battery that. issue goes to both scooters and vaping, actually. It, it, it okay. does. Do you know whether, while well, we're on the NICE topic, um, whether NICE has injury codes for vaping products, like whether it's exploding or whether it's overheating batteries or... Um, do you know if we're gathering that type of information? I do not know. I have to bring that back. Are, are we working at all with the um, poison control centers when it comes to the nicotine portion of vaping? Uh, uh, I would have to check to see if our collection for CDC includes that. Okay. I do not know off the top of my head, but, but we would not collect that for our purposes. Then. Okay. Uh. Um, we could follow up on that. I do have more detailed questions um, that I think you and I can discuss um, more individually. On nanotech, um, how much of our resources are being spent on this project and how does it compare with previous years? Because I, if I remember correctly, we, we were doing some nanotech and then we decided not to pursue that as much because other federal agencies were doing it. Now I see it back on the op plan. Um, can you give me a little bit of background there? Sure. We, uh, we had historically made significant investments on the order of approximately $2 million a year. Uh, that has tapered down over the last several years in this current operating plan. I think it's on the order of $50,000, largely in the voluntary standards uh, arena. We, made, we had to make significant investments in that area initially um, uh, just to lay the foundation on uh, measurement of the particles, uh, how to uh, quantify and characterize them, and so forth. Uh, with that investment, I think we've laid a foundation that then we can work with the uh, voluntary standards community at, a, at uh, bringing voluntary standards, uh, uh, performance standards in that, uh, in that area. So it's allowed us to shift our resources. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I studied nanotechnology years ago. It's very technical and very specialized. Do, do we have, um, you know, a person or persons within, is it your department or, or um, that, that specializes in nanotech? Do, uh, or do we need that? Uh, we do. We've, uh, uh, about a year ago, we, uh, we uh, filled a position that uh, uh, focuses on a nanotechnology program manager uh, okay. and have had, the, had her leading those efforts since. Terrific. Okay. Um, chemical hazards. The, the first bullet, sub-bullet point um, in, on page 17 talks about um, uh, the OFRs, and we do note that as part of the Commission's 2017 vote to grant the petition, the Commission also directed the staff to publish an interim guidance on in the Federal Register. Um, we now have um, the um, OFR report, as you know, from the National Academies of Science, and um, we have some interim guidance that was published, but now it's a little outdated. So are we drafting an, updated, an update of this guidance? What's the status of that? And we spent a lot of money on that. Uh, so the uh, interim guidance, we do not have uh, a plan for update in, as part of this. Uh, our resources in this area uh, for OFRs is really uh, working to uh, make concrete and uh, set up to implement the uh, approach uh, outlined by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, uh, and Medicine. So trying to lay the foundation so that uh, should we obtain the funding for, uh, for that research, we can shift the execution right away. So it's more on that, uh, the implementation of the uh, National Academy's plan than on updating guidance or other elements. So when you're thinking about implementing their plan, what does that look like in your mind? Uh, so mind? it's, we've got, uh, uh, so in granting the petition, the, the commission directed us to uh, 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 initiate rulemaking and uh, bring a CHAP, uh, Chronic Hazard which Advisory we did. Panel. Uh, which we've initiated rulemaking, and what we are in the process of is gathering the evidence that then the CHAP would eventually use. And so that evidence is comprised of uh, toxicological information, exposure information, so that the, the hazard and risk can be characterized. What we are, what the National Academies helped us with is that tox, uh, toxicological piece. How do we, how do we get at the, uh, the effects of, uh, uh, of the OFRs? Um, but they did it at a uh, somewhat high level. So what we're looking at in, in fiscal year 2019 is how do we uh, set up a, a, a structure with a contractor so that we can get that in evidence together on the tox piece uh, and then bring that before the chap down the road.
Has anybody expressed concern or do you have any concern? And I'm, I've been reading a lot about flame retardants and alternatives to flame retardants, including plant-based flame retardants. Is anyone concerned? This is a big project with a lot of money attached and, and, of course, a good project. But I'm wondering whether by the time we get to the end of that project, um, there are other options that we are not going to have information on. Uh, I think that the... Uh uh, what this project is focuses on, focused on is a particular subset of the uh, flame retardants uh, and flame retardant chemicals, uh, so the organohalogen. Um, I think uh, there will, uh, the National Academies identified about 160 chemicals at, at, the, at that particular time. We certainly would expect that to evolve. However, what we are uh, what we work with the National Academies on and would continue to evaluate is are those 14 subcategories, are those evolving or are we just seeing different chemicals in each of those 14 different buckets? And I think that's one of the challenges we'll have going forward is looking at uh, identifying do we have a, for lack of a better phrase, a new bucket that we have to be concerned with. Okay. Dwayne, I think that's it for you. Um, I have a couple for <coughs> compliance if you don't mind. Since my time is limited, Rob, I'll, I'll try to hit the, the shorter ones. On uh, page uh, 27 of the op plan, there's a milestone, M29, um, that discusses um, that e, um, EXC had a milestone in 2019 to assess the fast track pr um, program for possible changes to process and policies and then going forward implementing those. Can you um, uh, describe what you learned about the Fast Track program in 2019 and what changes you're planning to implement to improve the Fast Track program in 2020? Well, we, we did take a, a, a hard look at Fast Track uh, to, to find out, you know, what, if any, uh, not only process improvements, but it's been a number of years since we really thought through sort of what the overall objectives were, what some of the trade-offs were that were made when the, pro when the program started. Um, you know, and I, I, we have some ideas, and I, I, I don't, I'm, which I'm happy to, to come back with you and we meet with you and give you some more details. I think what we, what we want to do as part of our, our next steps is to get some feedback from the stakeholders as to some of the things that we're thinking about. Uh, some of the, the changes we might make to the entryway, for example, uh, of the program um, to make it more consistent, get people on the same timeline. Um, and also pr make sure that everybody knows going in uh, exactly what's required and, and has a, an easy access to providing that. I've gotten nothing but feedback from stakeholders, so we should probably talk so I can uh, share some of that with you. Sure. Okay. My time is up. I would yield you five minutes of my time if you'd like to continue uh, on. Sure, thank you. Um, I want to follow up on uh, Commissioner Adler's um, uh, questions about the non-compliant bike helmets. Um, I'm just wondering what um, challenges you're seeing in targeting those types of products, not just bike helmets, but all bike helmets, or I mean but all uh, of the non-compliant products that pose a safety hazard, especially on e-commerce e platforms. And what you know, do we have a plan to uh, address uh, those types of products? Well, you know, the first step, I think, in terms of any changes we would make to the way we're focusing on the sale of products in e-commerce, and obviously we have seen in the last several years, you know, enormous changes in the retail market and, and the shift to, to, to e-commerce selling, uh, you know, is to evaluate the baseline of where we are now. You know, we have in, in our mandatory standards, our regulatory enforcement office, uh, we have uh, uh, annual programs that are focused on each of the different products that we, that we regulate, and they each have components that reach into the e-commerce space. And the first question is, well, is that sufficient to meet the needs of where commerce has moved, or, or do we need to make changes? And then I think with that baseline in hand and also with an, uh, you know, a, an understanding and a discussion of sort of what the legal parameters are as it relates to certain players in the marketplace, you know, then decide what additional changes or, or next steps we want to take um, uh, as an agency in that area. I, I think that needs to be a priority. Um, I know we've been evaluating it for some time, and it is, it's, I, I'm afraid that it's passing us by and we're not capitalizing on that. So um, I, I would encourage um, that particular goal in the op plan to be something that, that we focus on. Um, there's also a note under the um, Office of Compliance uh, that, that there was a discussion of the possibility of hosting a workshop, a workshop with partner agencies to have an open discussion about jurisdictional issues. Um, 
I, I, we've had this discussion in the past. I mean, is this something that maybe we should make a line item under milestones for, or is this something that you know we've done in the past or, and, and we're not doing now? I'm not exactly sure which portion you're you're focused on, Commissioner. Do you, is that in, in this year's plan? Yes. So there was expansion of liquid nicotine enforcement. There was um, there was some notes in here that it's been difficult to, to prescribe compliance activities with e-cigarettes. We talked about some of the vaping issues and then um, possibility of hosting a workshop. We, Rob, we can follow up on okay, that. Okay, let's let's follow up on it. I'm sure I'm sure there's something here that I can give you some okay. info on. Um, I don't know where my time is. I have one, one or two uh, questions for communications. Two, two and a half minutes left or okay. four more if you need it. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Martiak. On page 34, um, under priorities activities, um, the penultimate bulletin bullet states to develop one communications activity on a major emerging, emerging hazard. Um, can you expand on this bullet and why we only have one? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've tried to earmark in our budgeting and going forward with the uh, agency we'll be working with to do something, a PSA or a video, but we're not identifying what it is yet. Uh, we'll be working on that as we work with compliance and the other and with hazard reduction about that. For example, it could be e-scooters, it could be something else. And so we haven't identified that yet, but we are planning on it and we've put it into our budget. Okay, um, I know we have almost a half a million dollars in communications um, marked for some of the communications activities. Um, so I, I would hope that um, once you identify it, you would bring it to the commission for us to um, you know, give you direction on what we think is, is best at, at the time that you identify it. Um, I also note in the, um, in the table here that there are six, uh, your goal is six um, uh, particular CPSC, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't find it, um, that quickly, um, uh, placing uh, six the national CPS, media. Yeah, places, national media. Yes. yes. Tell me about that and how you pick six and what you're thinking there. We've been trying to move from just impressions to actual engagements as a measurement, and we think that engagement will give us a better feedback on actually what's being done with the information we put out there. To that end, we're looking at doing these national media placements as an indicator of the kind of resonance we're hoping to get through interviews on a national scale. And so that's why we've picked a half a dozen here as a target to start with and uh, to see how that goes. But the whole, the, the fundamental point behind it is not to be just doing impressions where it goes into publication and this many eyes could have seen it, but it doesn't tell us whether they actually have or not to get something a little closer to where we get some feedback of what's going on. Okay, thank you. I think my time is up. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. Um, I just want to, because uh, to pick up on something that Commissioner Biacco raised, and that is the guidance that's up on the website with regards to organohalogen flame retardants. And let's see, I guess that would be Duane again, Duane. Um, so Commissioner Biacco talked about updating it, but it seems to me right now what is up there, the guidance that was provided by the commission is inconsistent with what NAS has recommended to us as well as what staff recommended to us. And it would seem to me, I guess my question is, if we removed that guidance, would that require any staff time or any hours or any kind of expenditure of resources? And then I'll just caveat that with, until we find out what is the guidance we should be, uh, we should be providing. I, I can take a shot at that. I, I'm uh, just trying to get back. I think I our memory on this was this was a commission-directed um, guidance document. I don't think there was a lot of staff involvement in the development of that guidance document. So if the commission decided to change that, I, I don't think there would be a lot of staff time associated with that. Very good. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adler. Well, with respect to that issue, I would uh, most respectfully disagree with uh, my colleague that it's outdated or inconsistent with what NAS uh, reported. What they is is a guidance. It's a general uh, concern uh, document that I think uh, I'd really be hard pressed to find any sort of uh, disagreement or inconsistency in the uh, in the guidance document. But in other in, to remove it, it would require, as far as I'm concerned, a commission vote. Um, I did want to associate myself very, very strongly with the comments that Commissioner Kay made with respect to uh, the 
inclined sleeper pro project. I think that terminology is much too narrow if we're really going to try to have the buckets that are comprehensive across children's products. And so um, I would urge you to consider coming up with a better title for it. Uh, and one of the things that pops into my mind is just called a sleeper standard um, and define it uh, precisely. But I do think this is, sends a strong wrong signal to the world to use the term inclined sleepers. So I do agree strongly with, uh, with Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Biacco, I just wanted to say one thing with respect to the consumer ombudsman. Um, when we did mid-year, I circulated a very, very thick document uh, proposing the idea of a consumer ombudsman, which I'll be delighted to share with you again. But it does seem to me that we have this incredibly successful SBO program that is really uh, a role model for other agencies. And it seems to me if you look at what other agencies are doing, they all, I shouldn't say all, many, many of them have things that are consumer ombudsmen or look tremendously like consumer ombudsman programs. And I think the CPSC would be well uh, guided to adopt something along those lines. So I strongly endorse what's in uh, the uh, staff package. Uh, and I really don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Nothing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Biacco? Uh, just a couple more. And Commissioner Adler, I remember that, um, but I also remember we did not vote on it and we did not um, put a, a account for it in the budget. Um, so there is, um, I'm not sure who answers this one. This is on um, Office of Research, uh, Resource Management. Um, on page 41, we have a key performance measure uh, that is the percentage of hiring managers trained on recruitment is targeted at 80%. Uh, can someone uh, provide a brief description of our current recruitment training program and what more we can do uh, to train hiring managers to make sure we get and retain the appropriate talents? I don't think we have the right person in the okay. room, but we're happy to follow up with you on that. Fair enough. And then I would have a question on coaching. Last question um, for this particular um, briefing. Where in the op plan, and I might have missed it, um, is it, um, are, are we accounting for or aren't we fixing the website as far as our saferproducts.gov? Because we've been working on this for quite some time, and I think everybody agrees it's not really all that user friendly. Are we fixing it or would we just let that one go? We, we have some funding that the commission had approved on mid-year, so that would be in FY 2019. So I think it was, I forget the exact dollar amount, but it was five or $600,000, and that contract is going to be let any day. Or okay. maybe, maybe it already has the safer products. Got, it's out. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I, I have a lot more questions, but it um, sounds like my colleagues are done. And rather than keep you all here, I will follow up with, with some of you individually. And I, I appreciate I know I had a lot of them, so thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adler, you're finished with questions. Commissioner Kay and Commissioner Biacco, you'll follow up. Okay. Having heard no further questions, at least at this time, I'd like again to thank staff, uh, Mr. Ray, uh, Mr. Hoffman, and Mr. Baker for uh, your time and all of the rest of the staff who stepped up to the table and provided us with answers. And I'm sure there will be more questions and more details. Um, we'll be asking of all of you as the days goes on, go on before the decisional. I also want to um, thank uh, the department, the uh, executive director in her office because this plan, uh, she sits on top of this plan and has really kept everyone uh, <laughs> in line to get what they needed uh, done to her and to put this document together. And it's a very well done document and I want to express my appreciation uh, to that as well. And just one final housekeeping item. Um, well, I plan to complete my term here at the agency till the end of October. Today marks my final, <clears throat> excuse me, my final public hearing as the acting chairman. And I just want to say what an honor it has been to lead this agency. And I thank you all for your support and your hard work. With that, this concludes the. Uh, Public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you.